Hello, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Mike Claffey. I'm chair of the Life Committee, and my role this evening is to introduce our speaker and uh, help you with some Q&A at the end of the session. Um, just out of courtesy, maybe just a reminder, mobile phones on silent. Um, that would be much appreciated. And to remind you that this session is being recorded for a podcast, but when we come to the Q&A, we turn off the recording to, um, to help open up the conversation quite a lot on Q&A. Um, I'd like to welcome Paul Fulcher. Um, Paul Fulcher is a work colleague of mine. He works in Milliman, London, uh, joined us 18 months ago. Um, but prior to joining Milliman in 2018, he spent 18 years in the investment banking sector um, in derivative and capital market solutions to insurers across Europe and was a well-known speaker and still is a well-known speaker at um, conventions. Um, He's here tonight, sorry, I should say professionally, Paul is a member of the Life Board of the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries in the UK, and for three years, 2015 to 2018, was the Life Research um, Committee Chair. Paul is here tonight to present a paper he was a partial author on. It was a working party in the UK, um, a review of the risk margin, Solvency 2 and beyond. Um, I guess we're interested in the risk margin because we're actuaries, we're interested in the risk margin because he open thinks there's no problem. Uh, you might comment on that in the Q&A, um, and I guess we're interested in it because of the paper itself, which is available on the Society's um, website. Okay, um, Paul's probably going to speak for about 40 minutes. Um, please do store up your questions. We'll then have a Q&A. I'll be back to help on that, and I'll send around the attendance sheet. If you sign in, you're here. If you forget, please come at the end. We'll have it at the top of the room. So on that basis, I'll hand over to Paul. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. Yes, so um, as, as we just said, I'm presenting, this is the usual disclaimer slide, I should probably add the disclaimer that I'm sort of presenting the working party's paper, the views I'll express are my own and don't always agree with the, the rest of the working party, particularly if you start asking questions, they'll definitely be my views rather than the, the working party's views. Why do we have a risk margin working party? Um, in just after, I think it was January 2016, so literally days after Solvency II came into force, the Treasury Select Committee, which is a, a very powerful committee, it's not the government, it's cross-party, but it's a very powerful committee of the UK Parliament, decided to announce an inquiry into Solvency II. Um, get, you know, month, after a month, they decided it had pretty much gone wrong. Um, the focus of the Treasury Select Committee, well, a lot of the focus of the Treasury Select Committee was on the annuity business. Now, annuity business in the UK is pretty much the only thing that customers actually buy from insurance companies anymore. Don't write much new business. Um, the individual annuity market in the UK rather died in about 2014. We used to have compulsory annuitisation, but the Chancellor took that away. Um, but that's largely been replaced by flows from the corporate sector. Now, that corporate sector flow, corporate pension schemes de-risking, putting their assets with insurance companies, has got a lot of political strength and will behind it. Why? Because from a society point of view, it's almost a win-win-win-win-win. The pensioners get transferred from a slightly dodgy corporate covenant to a regulated insurance company. Um, the corporates can get rid of a sort of an albatross, a liability that's hanging around their neck so they, in theory, can pay dividends or reinvest in business. So, so if you like, it frees up the corporate sector to do what it does, create wealth or whatever you think the corporate sector does. Um, interestingly as well, a lot of that money that flows into insurance companies' balance sheets flows back, largely because of the matching adjustment, into long-dated illiquid credit, which tends to be things like infrastructure, social housing, real estate lending, which again are seen as a sort of social good. So it's a, a market, if you like, that's seen as creating a, a, you know, a, a positive effect. Um, but as Solvency 2 came into force in around 2016, annuity rates were getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. Now, if I sort of asked people why you think annuity rates were getting worse, some of you might naively think if, if rates aren't great, it's a sign of no competition. Some of you might think that it's something to do with the fact that interest rates in the UK have been plummeting for pretty much the last 20 years. But this was the 2016, it was the UK, so no, it was all the fault of the EU. <laughs> so, um, if you like, the working party was, the, the, the inquiry of the committee was set up to say what's going on, 
apparently it was the risk margin. Um, a working party was set up. We had a working party on the matching adjustment and transitionals. We didn't have one on the risk margin. So the working party was set up, ready to do a couple of things. First of all, think what fixes we could lobby for in Solvency II, how we could change the risk margin. There was almost a presumption it was broken. Um, a, within Solvency II, or B, two days' time, post-Brexit flexibility. Um, it did turn out when they did opinion polls that as well as importing chlorinated chicken from America um, and, and controlling immigration, allegedly, um, actually being able to change the risk margin was the main reason people voted for Brexit. <laughs> if, but it's about the only rational reason I've come across, anyway. Um, so uh, so we, that, was the, that was the sort of the remit of the working party. And then a sort of a more fundamental remit, if you like. Just take a step back, and I'll try and do the presentation in two bits. Take a step back. If you were designing the risk margin with a clean sheet of paper, would you have got there? So just taking a little bit of a sort of a, a slightly flippant sort of view of where the risk margin came from. Imagine you're a legislator in sort of early 2000s, 2010-ish, trying to design a modern new regulatory system. What would you be thinking? Well, your first question is, I want to be prescriptive. I don't want any of this actuarial judgment nonsense. I don't really want companies to have to have actuaries anymore. Um, I'd like them all to be run by computers. So I need something that's pretty much objective. Um, market consistency, that's, that's a good way of doing something objective. Now, market consistency is easy on the asset side of the balance sheet. You can just look at the market price of most assets. Um, not very easy on the liability side. There's not really, and I'll come back to this phrase, a, a deep, liquid, transparent market to transfer insurance liabilities. So I need some sort of estimate of the cost of transferring insurance liabilities. And now, the basic cost of a liability, the, the best estimate, that bit is relatively easy, at least the cash flows are. So I've got my best estimate liability, but I need to add something to that because people typically don't take liabilities that have risk for the best estimate. They usually want some sort of compensation for risk. Um, if they're regulated entities, entities, they also, and you probably aren't going to be able to transfer your liabilities to something that's not regulated, they're also going to require capital and need some compensation for the cost of that capital. So we need some sort of proxy for that market value. Um, now, there's lots of ways you could do that, and I guess we'll talk about that later in the presentation as to how they, perhaps you could have made a proxy. But I need one, I need it to be objective, and I want it to be relatively prescriptive. So what do I do? Well, I look at sort of various methods. I do sort of surveys, ask people what they think. Um, and after I've done all that, I ask the insurance industry what they think. It is interesting, I have to say, almost everything in Solvency 2 that people hate, if you trace it back, it was the insurance industry that lobbied for it in the first place. And the risk margin is no exception, if you follow the history. Um, but I'm not sure what to do, so I, I basically sort of find a clever country over the border in Switzerland, and I basically nick their method. So pretty much the risk margin from solvency two is cut and paste from the Swiss solvency test. What do I do? Well, I basically sort of define the risk margin, this margin for transferring liabilities, as the cost of capital that another company would need to take that liability off me. Um, but if I'm doing that, I need to have some sort of assumption as to what that company is. Again, I could just go out and get market prices, and we'll come back to that. But that's not very objective. It's, it's not necessarily very easy to do. Um, I could actually think about what's the cost of capital for the insurance company if they just run off the book. But that's not really consistent with the Solvency 2 approach, which is one year VAR, some sort of disaster occurs, then I transfer the liabilities. So I need some sort of transferee company. Um, and so I make a few assumptions, which essentially is that the transferee company is basically my company. So I assume that I transfer my liabilities to a company that's a shell. It's sitting there completely empty. Um, I transfer my assets and liabilities to it, life and non-life separately for some slightly bizarre reason. Um, I assume it's closed after it's transferred, so there's no new business written. I assume it de-risks all of the market risk, or at least de-risks as far as possible, which is probably 99% of the way. Um, and a few other sort of slightly old assumptions that actually become quite important later on. I assume that any management actions I had, it has. I assume that it also uses the same internal model that I use, so it has the same capital requirements. It's only remarkably like me, actually. Um, and I assume it's subject to solvency too. Again, quite crucial. 
Um, so it actually has to raise capital to cover its solvency requirement. And I also assume, though, that though it's subject to solvency too, it can't use the matching adjustment or the volatility adjustment. It doesn't get any of the, the long-term guarantee measures. And then if you like, I follow the logic of that through. What cost of capital would that, in, or what, what would be the sort of cost of capital to recapitalise that insurance company over time if someone sort of sitting over here with a bank account essentially promised to provide all future capital requirements for that insurance company? And so I end up with the sort of the risk margin formula, if people are familiar with it. So the risk margin involves projecting the future solvency capital requirements on the assumptions I mentioned here. Um, so it's only the solvency for what are deemed non-hedgeable risks, except that non-hedgeable risks are taken as all underwriting risk, counterparty default risk, operational risk, only residual market risks. So actually, for most UK insurers, they don't tend to put any market risks in. Sometimes they do if they have something like a complicated inflation exposure. But all underwriting risks are deemed non-hedgeable. Again, something that's rather crucial to, to where we ended up with the risk margin. I also project those capital requirements into the future. I assume there's a cost each year, a magic 6%. It's worth saying technically that's risk-free plus 6, if you follow the logic of the maths through. Um, so I have a cost of capital in excess of risk-free of 6%. And then I discount all those future costs at the risk-free rate. And that, that's uh, something that got debated in the pages of the actuary. And we might either come to in the presentation or the Q&A as to whether that's appropriate. Although it sort of, it makes sense on the logic of the way the rules work, which is there's a, this money's put in and it sort of sits there in a risk-free asset waiting to be used up. Where did the 6% come from, which is one of the crucial parameters um, basically Switzerland, <laughs> strangely enough. Um, so if you look back into the history, they didn't really do much of a calibration in Solvency II. They essentially took the 6% from Switzerland. If you look into the Swiss documentation, they're not a huge amount where it came from. But largely speaking, they sort of looked at the cost of capital of triple B rated corporate companies in a slightly stressed environment. It was designed to be sort of a bit through the cycle. I, the cost of capital might vary a little bit, you know, 6% was designed to be slightly prudent through the cycle, stressed cost of capital. Um, you know, and that's the formula. Um, that's what we get for the Solvency II thing. Now, there's a very important implicit assumption in this, or two implicit assumptions, which I think get neglected sometimes. Essentially, the assumption is that this transferring company is subject itself to Solvency II. So the transferring company... We had a one in 200 year event, we've blown through our SCR, we've blown through our solvency capital requirement, we then go to transfer the liabilities to this entity. This entity to which we transfer the liabilities basically recapitalizes itself. So it also has to hold, I've blown through my solvency capital requirement, it has to set up a new one. Um, technically, if you follow the logic through, and this partly is the answer to the discount question, it also has to hold a risk margin. So it has to hold a risk margin as well. So you've got this sort of margin on margin thing going on. Um, and that, I think, is one of the biggest challenges that we as a profession made when we presented to the Treasury Select Committee, we as the UK profession. Um, we sort of said, but do you realise what you're assuming here? You're sort of almost giving people double protection. You're assuming that they've got capital to hold a one in 200 year event, but then you're assuming after that one in 200 year event that they've got liabilities that are now sufficient on a 99.5 percentile basis. Um, so you've almost got two 99.5 percentiles. Um, you know, it would have equally been possible to say, after a 99.5 percentile event, why would you need anything more than the best estimate? In which case you would basically end up with zero risk margin. Um, or it might have been possible to say something in between. And certainly in our discussions are the profession with the Treasury Select Committee, didn't seem like that had really been sort of talked about very much. Doesn't seem like the EOPA have thought about that a lot either. So one of the questions I think we asked was, is, is this too much protection? If you think about it as what are we actually creating for customer security, is it too much? Um, and I'll, again, we'll come back to that. But in a way, you know, based at least on its logic, um, it feels like the risk margin is logical. Um, at least on the assumptions that you put into it. Um, and it's not unreasonable. You should transfer your business to, a, to another company that can run itself off. Um, so in some ways, it was the right question. What's the problem? Well, basically, it gave the wrong answer. Um, why did it give the wrong answer? 
too big. Um, it was too volatile. Um, it moves very, very significantly with interest rates. <laughs> Probably the biggest one of all that scares the UK regulator and in some ways tells you something's going wrong. The big effect of the risk margin was not really to drive up prices of annuities. It was to mean that all the insurance companies transferred all the risk outside of the EU. Now, if yeah, that's a little bit worrying. A, it means that a lot of your capital is disappearing outside your regulated system, but it also probably tells you you've got the price wrong. Um, you know, if, if your market consistent price is so high that actually it's better to transfer that risk to someone else, well, immediately I'm thinking that's not very market consistent. It's telling me the price is too high. Um, and then finally, it's been remarkably hard to get anything changed. Um, you said in the introduction, um, and very, I think the very last slide I'll refer to this, a lot of lobbying's gone on, nothing has changed. Um, so, and just to put some numbers on that, um, as of, this was I think September 2016, so nine months into Solvency II, UK insurers were holding £44 billion pounds in the risk margin. Now, so transitional, that's a little bit exaggerated because some of it got taken away by transitionals, but actually that's the risk margin. Um, and that's a liability they did not hold under Solvency I. So I should have said under Solvency I in the UK, even when people did what they called realistic balance sheets, um, which were a bit like Solvency II, the liabilities were best estimate after, after, after the Solvency Capital requirements. There was no risk margin. Um, so this was a new liability that hit insurance companies' balance sheets, £44 billion. Pounds. Even for a big industry, that's a lot of money. Um, to put another number on that, this is the these numbers are from the UK regulator themselves. A 100 basis point fall in rates would cause a 27% increase in the risk margin. So it's, it's a ludicrously volatile number. It's got about a 27-year a duration. Um, and that pretty much happened. So the number at December 2015 was 30 billion. The number nine months later into Solvency II was 44. So the, the risk margin increased by a factor of almost 50% in the first few months of Solvency II. Um, now that was due to falling interest rates, but one of the questions is, were the falling rates being caused by the risk margin or were they something else that was going on? And just to put some numbers on that, this is like a, a little model we did. Now this is probably slightly understated because this is a, a, an annuity company that just writes level term annuities, um, a little model we built for our, our um, presentation. If you like, the blue lines are the interest rate. I think we've taken the 15 year swap rate or something like that. Good proxy for the discount rate, um, which as you can see did fall on more than 100 basis points in the first few years of, the risk of Solvency II. The yellow lines are the risk margin as a percentage of the number it started with. And you can see in our model, we've got a 40% increase in the risk margin, which is roughly in line with, with the figures from the regulator. Now, at first instance, that feels a bit ridiculous. It, it, you know, it's far too volatile. The only thing I would say is, annuities are a long-dated liability. There's gonna be some interest rate sensitivity. When we speak to reinsurers or to insurers that reinsure, what we found was that roughly speaking, reinsurers expressed the price of transferring longevity risk, um, which is what we're talking about here, um, as a percentage of the best estimate liability. So what they typically say is, you pay me the expect, I'll pay you the actual claims, you pay me the expected claims plus a margin. And that margin is 5% plus or minus. Might be three, might be 10, depending on the type of business. Um, so in some ways, the, lie, the, best, the, the risk margin probably really could be pretty well proxied by a, just an addition, 5% to the liabilities. So what we've done here, if you just contrast these two graphs, is we're actually now measuring the volatility of the risk margin relative to the volatility of the liabilities. So this is, oh, that was the wrong button to press. This is risk margin as a percentage of liabilities, um, which started out as about 7.7% and it went up to more like 10. Um, so you can see it's not as bad as this picture, but it's still quite volatile. And really, if you look at the market consistent price, what a reinsurer was charging, this graph should just really be a horizontal line. Um, there shouldn't be any interest rate sensitivity here. So it's, it's, it's too sensitive to interest rates. 
Where did we get to? What was the conclusion of the Treasury Committee report? Well, interestingly, despite the lobbying a little bit from the actuarial profession, um, they slightly disagreed with us on one thing. They did say they thought a risk margin made sense. So they said it should, there should be a risk margin. We, we provocatively posed the question whether they should just be zero. Um, no was the answer. It should be a risk margin. Um, on the other hand, there's all sorts of problems with it. Too volatile, too big, etc. cetera. Um, it's causing reinsurance overseas. Um, so therefore, there ought to be some sort of action taken. Um, and they rather push the PRA not to wait for, for Solvency II reviews and things like that to happen, but to do something in advance. Um, there was actually some interesting wording in the regulation, in, in the report. They actually said the PRA, and this was only 2016-17, should adopt a post-Brexit mentality um, and essentially say, I don't care what the EU will say, we'll just change them anyway. Um, they didn't, it has to be said, but that was what they were told to do. Um, what they did have was a sort of magic solution, um, which we called the management action solution. And this was something that legal in general sort of cooked up a little bit with the ABI and some clever lawyers, Association of British Insurers, which was a cunning way of sort of getting you back to using reinsurance pricing, but in theory still satisfying the directive. It's just, it's just quite interesting, this. So what they did was they, they basically realised that any management actions that the insurance company had get inherited by this transfer company. They also made the economic observation that pretty much the price you pay to transfer longevity risk is essentially sort of giving up all the spread on the assets. So essentially, if you sort of have a portfolio of assets, if you de-risk those assets, you might as well transfer the longevity risk. You want to get the longevity risk for free by giving up the spread. So if the rules say you're going to de-risk, well, you may as well get rid of the longevity. So they, they, they came up with this kind of idea that they have this, this, the solution was this. Not this particularly, but it looked remarkably like this. It was literally a piece of paper, very short resolution, passed by the board that said, in the unlikely event that we decide to de-risk all of our assets, we will immediately go and reinsure all our longevity risk as well. Basically means nothing, except when the risk margin kicks in. Then when the risk margin kicks in, you apparently have de-risked your assets, so you've apparently got reinsurance. So essentially, for the risk margin calculation, you've reinsured all your business to the reinsurance community. So it was a cunning solution that sort of basically took the risk margin away without changing the directive and replaced it by an estimate of the cost of getting reinsurance. Now, the PRA were presented with this idea. Their first reaction was um, to basically be violently ill. Um, I think they said it was hypothetical and somewhat artificial. Hard to argue with that. Um, it changed the answer without any reduction in actual risk. Hard to argue with that. Um, therefore, we don't like it very much. Um, and also, they're a bit worried if they let something like this happen, would clever sort of bankers and lawyers, people like me and lawyers, come up with all sorts of other things that made the Solvency II uh, technical provisions much lower and the SCR much lower. Um, so they basically said, you must be joking. Um, then the Treasury Select Committee told them to adopt a post-Brexit mentality. So they actually thought this was a jolly good idea. Then someone, and I'm told this, called up the OPA, who pointed out that you can't really adopt a post-Brexit mentality until post-Brexit. Um, so they were told that was a bad idea. And if they did this, the OPA would actually issue a sort of a guidance note saying, by the way, you can't use management actions in that way. Um, so as of now, this still exists as a bit of paper, but hey, maybe Saturday. Um, <laughs> or maybe the 1st of January next year, or whatever period in between. Um, so that's sort of the background as to where we are. And um, the other thing I guess worth saying is, you know, sorry, I should have said that EOPA um, had a 2020 review of, sorry, 2018 review of Solvency II, so their initial review, which is concluded. Um, a lot of hope that they would change the risk margin. They made no change whatsoever. Um, most of the debate was around the cost of capital. There wasn't really any other debates at all. So they didn't even consider other aspects of the risk margin. They pretty much rejected all lobbying and then just looked at the arguments around the cost of capital. So EOPA didn't really help either. But one thing we wanted to do was take a, as a working party, that was almost the where are we now. Let's take a step back. This is one of my favourite Albert Einstein quotes. Um, if I had an hour to solve a problem, I'd spend the first 55 minutes determining what the question to ask was. Um, so... We had a little bit of a sort of think. We went back into history and we looked at what was the risk margin supposed to do. Um, 
And then we added a few. So the green things here are the six original, have I counted that right? Yes, six, good. Um, the six original things that the risk margin was supposed to achieve, which is why we ended up with the cost of capital method, because it was deemed to achieve them. We've added five more that we think are probably more, a little bit post-financial crisis sort of reasons to a risk margin needs to do. And then what we've tried to do on a sort of tick cross basis is work out if the risk margin does them. So does it protect policyholders? Yes, possibly too much. Is it market consistent? In theory, yes. In practice, no, produces too high a cost. Is it objective? Yes, with one slight issue actually on the objectivity, which is that it, it does have this slightly odd assumption that the company you transfer the business to uses your internal model and it has no other business and uses your, and therefore the business mix is your business mix, which actually means two different insurers do get different risk margins for the same risk which doesn't make it very objective, so probably ought to be a cross on there. Um, but it also actually is one of the reasons we think the risk margin might be too high. In other words, if the only people who'd reinsure your business were monoline companies who literally had no business, then that's probably where you get the risk margin. Um, why is it that it's so cheap to transfer it to the US? Because rightly or wrongly, US and Bermuda reinsurers think they've got some diversification benefit with the other business. So actually, we think that implicit assumption might be part of the problem with the risk margin. Is it applicable to different risks? Well, yes, except it definitely produces a very high answer for things like longevity risk, which is why that's what I'm talking about. For something like sort of short-dated non-life business, it probably produces too low an answer. You know, one year's cost of capital, neither here nor there. Um, is it practical... Well, it wasn't terribly practical, but it is now because we're doing the calculations. So one of the pushbacks you do get if you come up with different methods is, yeah, but we've got a sunk cost now. We've, we've built the computers. Does it create pro-cyclicality? That's a big thing for regulators now. I'm not totally convinced that the reason interest rates fell in the world economy was the risk margin. Um, there's perhaps a little bit more going on in the world than that. But... You know, and speaking as an investment banker, I do actually recall one of the largest UK insurers calling me up and saying, I can't believe I'm doing this, but, you know, can we get some interest rate swaps from you, long-dated 30-year interest rate swaps are below 1%, which sounds quite good now, below zero might be the new number, but, you know, at least I just, this is stupid, I don't want to do this, but I have to because I've got this liability. So there's a little bit of evidence, I think, that at least it made markets a bit more volatile and drove rates down a bit more. Is it consistent with IFRS 17? Yes, a little bit because IFRS 17 has sort of slightly nicked the idea. Um, Switzerland to the EU to IFRS 17. Is it compatible with international capital standards? Yes, but there's another method in international capital standards which we think is interesting. Does it make us equivalent in the UK post-Brexit? Well, clearly if we carry on using the same method, yes. Does it create appropriate incentives? Big no. Um, very, very clearly, the risk margin is driving behaviour. Um, now, it's not a bad thing that people transfer their risk to reinsurers who are more diverse and can deal with it. And actually, some of the monoline UK insurers did that anyway. But it is a bad thing if people are doing it precisely because of that. And, you know, some headline names like Rothsay or Pension Insurance Corporation in the UK, monolines, always used to transfer risk to reinsurers. Prudential, biggest UK insurance company, a, made it very clear they were doing it just because of solvency too, and B, actually pulled out of the annuity market um, as a result of the risk margin. Um, and is it theoretically sound? Mm, well, yes, with a few provisos. So what else could be done? Um, these were all of the things that people lobbied for in the 2018 review. 99% um, of all the discussion was around lobby lowering the cost of capital, because it's just such an easy solution. Um, unfortunately, OPA, and I have to admire them for this, said, thank you very much. We've, we've thoroughly reviewed all of your very helpful uh, comments on the fact that the cost of capital shouldn't be 6%, and we actually agree with you, and it should be somewhere between 6.7 and 7.8. How you left. Um, the industry, oh, let's we'll stick with 6, shall we? Yeah, so, um, wasn't one of the more successful pieces of lobbying that. Um, all the other stuff got a little bit ignored, largely because the OPA actually thought this was out of scope. Um, but some ones that we thought were interesting, varying the cost of capital with interest rates. Now, the cost of capital automatically varies with interest rates because it's risk-free plus six. But there is some evidence. Now, I say some evidence. One paper that was written in about 2005, but it keeps, you know, it does keep being referred to. Um, 
there is some evidence that the cost of capital that companies have itself tends to fall as rates fall. Uh, if you've got 10% rates, people want a bigger margin on 10%. When rates are zero, people are happy to accept a lower margin. And roughly speaking, this particular paper at least suggested that 100 basis point fall in interest rates actually reduced costs of capital by another 30 or 40 basis points on top of the 100. So maybe you could make the cost of capital itself a function of interest rates. The benefit of that would be it would, would reduce the volatility of the risk margin, as we'll see. Should you use the matching adjustment and volatility adjustment, or should you even use a much higher discount rate altogether? Um, the argument sort of here was the existing life company pretty much always is using the matching adjustment if it's a UK annuity firm, or the volatility adjustment if it's not. So why on earth shouldn't the receiving company be able to do that? The counter-argument to that is because it's just de-risk all its assets. Um, so if you like, EOPA were a little bit more open to this one. And again, it was a bit like, well, be careful what you wish for. Feel free to use the matching adjustment if you want, but then you're also going to have to hold capital and therefore future costs of capital each year against the credit risk associated with the assets. The last one here linked to reinsurance pricing. Why on earth are we just not you know, using reinsurance pricing? Um, the recitals to Solvent Institute actually define the risk margin as the amount you would have to pay to transfer your liabilities to another undertaking. So frankly, if you know what that answer is, if there is a market price, why not use that rather than some artificial calculation? And originally in Solvency 2, the directive said hedgeable and non-hedgeable risk. Again, you could argue longevity is hedgeable. Those words disappeared at some point, so that doesn't say that anymore. It now says, you know, all demographic risk is part of the risk margin. But again, you could put those words back. And then this last one, a slightly interesting one, caused a bit of chaos when I presented this at the, um, the uh, life insurance, uh, the um, insurance actuaries. This thing called tapering. Um, I rather foolishly said you can only cure cancer once and got berated by various people in the audience who told me that that wasn't true and it got very complicated. Let me just say you can only have a mass lap, you can only lapse your policy once. So one of the implicit assumptions in the risk margin, if you like, is, again, each year you sort of reset your capital up. Well, if you've got capital you can only lose once, you, by, almost by definition you can't keep having to reset it up. Or if you do have to reset it up, then why would you want a compensation for that? Um, so, and you, and you can construct examples quite easily of policies where the risk margin is higher, or the technical provisions including the risk margin, are higher than the worst possible outcome that can possibly occur in any circumstance um, because of this calculation. Um, because you effectively, the 6% cost of capital is so high compared to risk-free rates that you, you almost end up being overcompensated for risk. Um, to be fair, those examples are quite artificial. Um, you, know, you have to work a bit hard to get them. But there at least is some suggestion that you should probably allow for this, the fact that risks aren't in, are, independent, are not independent of each other. Now, the ABI sort of constructed a very clever argument about that, which they didn't seem terribly keen to share with anyone. Because um, they actually then said, well, the best way to do that is just when we have our formula. I'm going to regret trying to go back, aren't I? But there you go. go on, I'm going to regret this. Uh, when we project the future SCRs, let's just arbitrarily put a lambda in there a lambda factor, lambda t times SCRT, unless you feel like just have the future capital decaying over time. Um, now again, the, anyone mathematical in the audience will immediately realise basically has the effect of increasing the, if you put a lambda, if you put a higher, a, a sort of a, a dampening factor on the top, like 0 0.9 to the t, what you've actually done is increase the discount rate at the bottom. Or, so it's just a sort of a, a bodgy way of getting to the answer they first thought of. Um, but they came up at least with some sort of argument for this what they call tapering factor, that you should just reduce the capital over time. Just what do those sort of things mean? To put some numbers on them, this was our base, base model at 31 to 7, 2018, a risk margin of just over 8%. We reckon the indicative reinsurance pricing for this is about five, maybe even lower, maybe three to five. Um, that means that probably the cost of capital should be about three to get you to the, to the correct answer. Um, the industry, I think, argued for a cost of capital of four, um, which gives you something close to reinsurance pricing. The OPA said it should be 7.8. Um, so if you like, there's a, quite a large bid offer spread there between what the industry think and what EOPA think. Um, the next two are this, this using the matching adjustment that I mentioned, where you sort of gain with one hand and lose with the other. So you gain, 
here and here by using the matching adjustment in your calculations or your discount rate, which is great. And then what you give with one hand, they take away with the other because they make your capital requirements higher. So you actually end up back where you started. And then there's this ABI tapering thing that basically pretty much has the effect of reducing the cost of capital. Um, what does it do on volatility terms? This is my one where I let the, intro, the, the cost, the um, discount rate vary with the cost of capital. We sort of calibrated this so you set your cost of capital at December 2015 at 6%, but then as rates fell, you sort of reduced the cost of capital accordingly by about 35% for each fall in interest rates. And what you can see is it does take a lot of the dampening away. Tell me, get to this here, we've got something that's probably reasonable um, in terms of its output. I said I speak for 40 minutes and I'm going over, but I will be done by an hour. <laughs> um, assessing the alternatives. We just want to try to again the, the tick and cross box on all of these alternatives. Just to pick out a couple of highlights. Reducing the cost of capital, actually the 6%, maybe 5 to 6, it seems to be what's being used internationally. Um, it, the big, big, big advantage of this, why all the lobbying? It's just so much easier changing six to three or six to four, don't need to change any of the computer systems. Not much theoretical justification for it, but it gives a nice answer. Letting the cost of capital vary with rates, very neat solution, we think, makes the interest rate sensitivity much less. The big question mark against it is actually practicalities. It's not that hard to put, instead of 6% in your formula, risk-free plus times 0.35 plus 5% or whatever, that's easy. Hedging is hard. Um, any of you have dealt with sort of interest rate hedging with the ultimate forward rate under Solvency 2? You come up with these artificial mechanisms, you end up with a balance sheet that's very artificial. You end up with a ludicrous dependence on whatever rate it was you to set the cost of capital. Allowing for the volatility and matching adjustment, all fine, just this, does, do you actually gain anything by it? And then cost of reinsurance. There's some big issues. Um, it's it's not very objective because you've got to go out and get that number and there's not like a, it's not a deep liquid and transparent market. It doesn't really work for anything other than longevity, but it does create appropriate incentives and it is theoretically sound. Almost by definition, it's the right answer. It is literally the market consistent cost. And then sort of last couple of slides, um, we sort of took a bit of a more fundamental step back and looked at what's sort of been done elsewhere. Um, now, there are three different methods. The first three here are all variations on the same theme. I would say, if you ask an actuary, if you traditionally give an actuary some best estimate assumptions and then tell the actuary, well, you've got to put some sort of margin, well, actuaries just take that best estimate assumption and add a margin for luck. Um, you know, whether you call that, so provision for adverse deviation is what we've got there. Um, and that's what they use in China. So traditional actuarial approach, but also in China. In China, in their CROS system, which is their sort of solvency two equivalent, essentially you do your best estimate and then the regulator pretty much says, oh, and then take your mortality assumption and times it by 10% and redo your best estimate and the difference is the risk margin. Um, then a couple of other ones. One is to do with some sort of runoff percentile. So instead of taking a 50th percentile as your best estimate, why not do a 75th percentile? That was, that was the other one they originally considered in Solvency 2 as an alternative to the cost of capital. Hey, guess what? The industry said it was a terrible idea. They thought the cost of capital was great until they had to do the numbers. Um, Australia does it in their non-life regime. And interestingly, IFRS, as I would read the rules, probably requires you to do that as, a, as at least a base case for the risk adjustment. And then the third one, another variation on a theme of padding your parameters, um, what they call, a, if you like, a value at risk thing. So it's almost like have a mini SCR. So if you look at what they've done in international capital standards, what they call the P-moche or the prudential moche, margin on current estimate, if you look at, interestingly, in pretty much all the Asian countries, Hong Kong notably, but Singapore, various others, when they've introduced risk-based capital regimes, they've by and large looked at the cost of capital method and thrown it away, possibly learning from our mistakes, and have gone for this method, which is to sort of take a, a, a sort of percentile, but on an overall basis for the portfolio, for all the non-hedgeable risks. Now, this value at risk approach has the massive advantage for the insurance industry, it's like a disadvantage for a regulator. It frankly produces quite low answers. Because instead of taking a 99.5 percentile, what you do for the SCR, for all risks, 
You basically redo your SCR calculation at something like a 75th percentile and for some risks. So by definition, that number is less than the solvency capital requirement. You always end up with a risk margin that's lower. In fact, I think it was something like 30% of the SCR. So great answer. Um, probably, probably not prudent enough on longevity. It was certainly below the reinsurance pricing. But it is the standard that's being adopted pretty much elsewhere in the world, I would say. The, the cost of capital has lost the global battle. And then a couple of more sort of radical ones. One I mentioned, why bother having a risk margin? Um, we still think there's some logic to that. And if you don't think, you know, surviving a one in 200 year event, why on earth should a customer think after that's happened? They have any more than a 50-50 chance of meeting liabilities and isn't sort of that what, what compensation schemes are there to deal with? I shouldn't they be the, the providers of capital after that event? Um, and if you don't think that's proven enough, well, make your SCR higher. Why not just double your SCR for luck or something like that? Um, what's the precedent for that? Well, the UK regime, pre-Solvency 2, didn't have a risk margin. Um, and then the final one, which is interesting, completely radical change, forget this one-year VAR business. So, frankly, this involves ripping up Solvency 2. Um, don't do a one-year VAR and then try and determine what your provisions are. Just run your business off over the long term. Um, the Lloyds market, the non-life market in Lloyds, they have to do that as a second test. They do risk margin plus one year VAR, SCR, and they also do a runoff, and they have to take the higher of the two. And there's an interesting new development in the UK, something called super funds, which are sort of halfway between a pension fund and an insurance company. They're sort of semi, they're almost like companies, except the sole purpose of the company is to sort of acquire other companies and get their pension schemes. Um, so they're regulated like pension funds, but behaving more like insurers. Again, the proposed regime for those doesn't have a risk margin. It's more like a 90th percentile runoff basis. So there are precedents. And then on my tick cross boxes for those, um, what are some of the key points here? The runoff method, um, the first one here, it's actually what IFRS 17, if I read the rule strictly, doesn't require you to do. The risk, the risk adjustment is quite loosely worded in IFRS 17, but it requires you to then, having done your risk adjustment, benchmark it against something. The way it describes the benchmark, it asks you to calculate an equivalent percentile, to me sounds rather like a runoff percentile. Um, doesn't seem to be what companies have actually done, but that seems to be what, uh, maybe I'm not one on this, but it seems to be what the rules require. Um, it isn't, on the other hand, part of ICS. ICS doesn't allow that, um, and it would actually be relatively complicated for people to do because it involves a long-term projection. Um, this VAR idea, the PMOCHE, the Prudential Margin on Current Estimate that's used, actually a lot of green in there. Um, this isn't really designed so you add up the greens and knock off the reds and we have a score. It's only supposed to be indicative, but there's a lot of green on that slide. Um, on that column, it's relatively easy to implement, largely because the calculation is a subset of your SCR calculation, and you're probably going to have to do it anyway for international standards. It sort of seems to be what a lot of people are doing for IFRS 17. My question mark is I'm not sure that's what's intended, but that's what they're doing. It's very much consistent with ICS. In fact, that seems to be winning the battle. And wearing my British post-Brexit mentality on the Saturday morning hat, I think if we're talking to the EU about equivalence, if we can say, look, we've obeyed international standards, that's rather easier than coming up with our own method of our own. So it might make the assault to do equivalence decision relatively easy, because to some extent they'll probably have to grant equivalence, or you'll have to grant equivalence to international standards. Is it theoretically sound? I'm not sure it is, actually. It's probably the big, big flaw with this one. Not vaguely clear where it actually comes from. Um, quite why 75th percentile and quite why you do a one-year VAR. And it probably produces too low an answer. So I probably ought to have had a big cross in the policy order protection box. Runoff capital, really probably a lot of red on there. It's just too complicated. It's, this is solvency three. Um, the only thing I would say in the UK is if, if they go the route of allowing these super funds to be regulated that way, there may well be pressure to allow insurance companies to be regulated that way because you may have created an unlevel playing field. The sensible thing to do might be to watch that regime and see how it goes and then think about it. And holding no risk margin, well, it's objective. Zero is an objective number. It's applicable to different risks. Zero is applicable to everything. It's very easy to implement. Zero. Um, but otherwise... Uh, being pushed back. And to some extent, the battle's been lost. 
Um, this was probably a battle to have in 2014-15, not having a risk margin. Um, now IFRS 17's got the risk adjustment, International Capital Standards has got the moche, the Treasury Select Committee like it. I think the chance of, you know, the, the EU probably won't be terribly happy if Britain immediately Saturday morning turns off the risk margin. Um, and it probably actually creates too much of an incentive to keep risk rather than retain it. So where do we end up as a working party? Um, we actually quite like the idea of letting the, risk, the, the cost of capital rate vary with risk-free. We actually think that there might be an argument for using an illiquidity premium, but something but more like the volatility adjustment. So something that you could arguably earn risk-free just from illiquidity liabilities rather than taking real risk. Um, we actually think that longevity risk, and this is probably the biggest thing we would think of post-Brexit for the UK, might be to allow the management action solution and or simply to change the rules in the UK to say hedgeable versus non-hedgeable rather than demographic risk versus market risk. Um, and we actually quite like the, the percentage moche thing because it probably gives a nice answer and frankly is the way the international world's heading. And then just to sort of finish off on EOPA, um, 2020 review. Um, one big disappointment in the scope of that review, if you can see here, uh, which we're putting here, given what I've just said that we quite favour other methods, we were actually rather disappointed to see that EOPA was pretty much told to stick with the cost of capital method. On the other hand, pretty much everything else was up for grabs, so at least all of the questions about the cost of capital method that they ignored in 2018, they considered this time. So EOPA, in their usual fashion, gave it a very detailed and thorough consideration and uh, recommended no changes to the risk margin, back to my stubborn mule. Although actually, latest update, um, not time to put on slides, Gabriel Bernardino was speaking today in uh, probably Frankfurt, but I'm not sure where, but at a, at a conference on the Solvency 2020 review and did say that despite the EOPA recommendation, they were aware that the risk margin was still had issues and so that it shouldn't be treated as quite as closed as maybe the recommendation suggested but it was still a bit of a depressing outcome. And that's it. Slightly longer than I said, but not much longer. I think 45 minutes. <laughs> Do you want to 